A School Story by M. R. James Two men in a smoking room were talking of their private school days. At our school, said A, we had a ghost's footmark on the staircase. What was it like? Oh, very unconvincing. Just the shape of a shoe with a square toe, if I remember right. The staircase was a stone one. I never heard any story about the thing. That seems odd when you come to think of it. Why didn't somebody invent one, I wonder? You can never tell with little boys. They have mythology of their own. There's a subject for you, by the way. The folklore of private schools. Yes, the crop is rather scanty, though. I imagine if you were to investigate the cycle of ghost stories, for instance, which the boys at private schools tell each other, they would all turn out to be highly compressed versions of stories out of books. Nowadays, the Strand and Pearsons and so on would be extensively drawn upon. No doubt. They weren't born or thought of in my time. Let's see. I wonder if I can remember the staple ones that I was told. First... There was the house with a room in it with a, which is, in which a series of people insisted on passing a night, and each of them in the morning was found kneeling in the corner and had just time to say, I've seen it, and died. Wasn't that the house in Berkeley Square? I dare say it was. There was a man who heard a noise in the passage at night, opened his door and saw someone crawling towards him on all fours with his eye hanging out on his cheek. There was, besides... Ah, oh, let me think... Yes, the room where a man was found dead, in bed with a horseshoe mark on his forehead. Then the floor under the bed was covered with marks of horseshoes also. I don't know why. There was also the lady who, on knocking her bedroom door in a strange house, heard a thin voice among the bed curtains say, Now we're shut in for the night. None of those had any explanation or sequel. I wonder if they go on still, those stories. Oh, likely enough. With additions from the magazines, as I said. You never heard, did you, of a real ghost at a private school? I thought not. Nobody has that I ever came across. From the way in which you said that, I gather that you have? I really don't know. But this is what was in my mind. I, it happened at my private school thirty-odd years ago, and I haven't any explanation of it. The school, I mean, was near London. It was established in a large and fairly old house, a great white building with very fine grounds about it. There were large cedars in the garden, as there are in so many of the older gardens in the Thames Valley, and ancient elms in the three or four fields which we used for our games. I think, probably, it was quite an attractive place, but boys seldom allow that their schools possess any tolerable features. I came to the school in a September soon after the year 1870, and among the boys who arrived on the same day was one whom I took to, a Highland boy whom I will call MacLeod. I needn't spend time in describing him. The main thing is that I got to know him very well. He was not an exceptional boy in any way, not particularly good at books or games, but he suited me. The school was a large one. There must have been from 120 to 130 boys there as a rule, and so a considerable staff of masters was required, and there were rather frequent changes among them. One term, perhaps it was my third or fourth, a new master made his appearance. His name was Samson. He was a tallish, stoutish, pale, black-bearded man. I think we liked him. He had travelled a good deal and had stories which amused us on our school walks so that there was some competition among us to get within earshot of him. I remember too, <laughs> dear me, I've hardly thought of it since then, but he had a charm on his watch chain that attracted my attention one day, and he let me examine it. It was, I now suppose, a gold Byzantine coin. There was an effigy of some absurd emperor on one side. The other side had been worn practically smooth, and he cut on it, rather barbarously, his own initials, G.W.S., and a date... 24th of July, 1865. Yes, I can see it now. He told me he'd picked it up in Constantinople. It was about the size of a florin, perhaps rather smaller. Well, the first odd thing that happened was this. Samson was doing Latin grammar with us. One of his favourite methods, perhaps it is rather a good one, was to make us construct sentences out of our own heads to illustrate the rules he was trying to make us learn. 
Of course, that is a thing which gives a silly boy a chance of being impertinent. There are lots of school stories in which that happens, or anyhow there might be. But Samson was too good a disciplinarian for us to think of trying that on with him. Now, on this occasion he was telling us how to express remembering in Latin, and he ordered us each to make a sentence bringing up the verb mimini, I remember. Well, most of us make up some ordinary sentence such as I remember my father or he remembers his book or something equally uninteresting. I dare say a good many put down memino librum meum and so forth, but the boy I mentioned, MacLeod, was evidently thinking of something more elaborate than that. The rest of us wanted to have our sentences passed and get on to something else, so some kicked him under the desk, and I, who was next to him, poked him and whispered to him to look sharp. But he didn't seem to attend. I looked at his paper and saw he had put down nothing at all, so I jogged him again harder than before and upbraided him sharply, sharply for keeping us all waiting. That did have some effect. He startled and seemed to wake up, and then very quickly he scribbled about a couple of lines on his paper and showed it up with the rest. As it was the last, or nearly the last, to come in, and as Samson had a good deal to say to the boys who had written Meminiscimus Patrim Meo and the rest of it, it turned out that the clock struck twelve before he had got to MacLeod, and MacLeod had to wait afterwards to have his sentence corrected. There was nothing much going on outside when I got out, so I waited for him to come. He came very slowly when he did arrive, and I guessed there had been some sort of trouble. Well, I said, what did you get? Oh, I don't know, said MacLeod, nothing much, but I think Samson's rather sick with me. Why, did you show him up some rot? No fear, he said. It was all right as far as I could see. It was like this. Memento. That's right enough for remember, and it takes a genitive. Memem memento pute inter quator taxos. What silly rot, I said. What made you shove that down? What does it mean? That's the funny part, said MacLeod. I'm not quite sure what it does mean. All I know is, it just came into my head and I corked it down. I know what I think it means, because just before I wrote it down I had a sort of picture of it in my head. I believe it means, remember the well among the four. What are those dark sort of trees that have red berries on them? Mountain ashes, I suppose you mean. I never heard of them, said MacLeod. No, I'll tell you. Use. Well, what did Samson say? Why, he was jolly odd about it. When he read it, he got up and went to the mantelpiece and stopped quite a long time without saying anything, but his back to me. And then he said, without turning round, and rather quiet, What do you suppose that means? I told him what I thought, only I couldn't remember the name of the silly tree. And then he wanted to know why I put it down, and I had to say something or other. And after that he left off talking about it, and asked me how long I'd been here, and where my people lived, and things like that. And then I came away, but he wasn't looking a bit well. I don't remember any more of what was said by either of us about this. Next day, MacLeod took to his bed with a chill or something of the kind, and it was a week or more before he was in school again. And as much as a month went by without anything happening that was noticeable. Whether or not Mr. Sampson was really startled, as MacLeod had thought, he didn't show it. I'm pretty sure, of course, now, that there was something very curious in his past history, but I'm not going to pretend that we boys were sharp enough to guess any such thing. There was one other incident of the same kind as the last which I told you. Several times since that day we had to make up examples in school to illustrate different rules, but there had never been any row except when we did them wrong. The last there came a day when we were going through those dismal things which people call conditional sentences, and we were told to make a conditional sentence expressing a future consequence. We did it, right or wrong, and showed up our bits of paper and Samson began looking through them. All at once he got up, made some odd sort of noise in his throat, and rushed out by a door that was just by his desk. We sat there for a minute or two, and then, I suppose it was incorrect, but we went up, I and one or two others, to look at the papers on his desk. Of course I thought someone must have put down some nonsense or other, and Samson had gone off to report him. 
All the same, I noticed that he hadn't taken any of the papers with him when he ran out. Well, the top paper on the desk was written in red ink, which no one used, and it wasn't in anyone's hand who was in the class. They all looked at it, MacLeod and all, and took their dying oaths that it wasn't theirs. Then I thought of counting the bits of paper, and of this I made quite certain there were seventeen bits of paper on the desk and sixteen boys in the form. Well, I bagged the extra paper and kept it, and I believe I have it now. And now you will want to know what was written on it. It was simple enough, and harmless enough, I should have said. Si tu non veneris ad me, ego veniam ad te. Which means, I suppose, if you don't come to me, I'll come to you. Could you show me the paper? interrupted the listener. Yes, I could, but there's another odd thing about it. That same afternoon I took it out of my locker. I know for certain it was the same bit, for I made a finger mark on it, and no single trace of writing of any kind was there on it. I kept it, as I said, and since that time I have tried various experiments to see whether sympathetic ink had been used, but absolutely without result. So much for that. After about half an hour, Samson looked in again, said he felt very unwell and told us we might go, he came rather gingerly to his desk and gave just one look at the uppermost paper. Then I suppose he thought he must have been dreaming. Anyhow, he asked no questions. That day was a half holiday, and next day Samson was in school again, much as usual. That night, the third and last incident in my story happened. We, MacLeod and I, slept in a dormitory at right angles to the main building. Samson slept in the main building on the first floor. There was a very bright full moon. At an hour, which I can't tell exactly, but some time between one and two, I was woken up by somebody shaking me. It was MacLeod, and a nice state of mind he seemed to be in. Come, he said, come, there's a burglar getting in through Samson's window. As soon as I could speak, I said, well, why not call out and wake everybody up? No, no, he said. I'm not sure who it is. Don't make a row. Come and look. Naturally, I came and looked, and naturally there was no one there. I was cross enough and should have called MacLeod plenty of names. Only, I couldn't tell why. It seemed to me that there was something wrong, something that made me very glad I wasn't alone to face it. We were still at the window looking out, and as soon as I could I asked him what he had heard or seen. I didn't hear anything at all, he said. But about five minutes before I woke you, I found myself looking out of this window here, and there was a man sitting or kneeling on Samson's window sill and looking in, and I thought he was beckoning. What sort of man? MacLeod wriggled. I don't know, he said, but I can tell you one thing. He was beastly thin, and he looked as if he was wet all over, and, he said, looking around and whispering as if he hardly likes to hear himself, I'm not at all sure that he was alive. He went on talking in whispers some time longer and eventually crept back to bed. No one else in the room woke or stirred the whole time. I believe we did sleep a bit afterwards, but we were very cheap next day. And next day Mr. Sampson was gone, not to be found, and I believe no trace of him has ever come to light since. In thinking it over, one of the oddest things about it all has seemed to me to be the fact that neither MacLeod nor I ever mentioned what we had seen to any third person whatever. Of course, no questions were asked on the subject, and if they had been, I am inclined to believe that we could not have made any answer. We seemed unable to speak about it. That is my story, said the narrator, the only approach to a ghost story connected with a school that I know, but still, I think, an approach to such a thing. The sequel to this may perhaps be reckoned highly conventional, but a sequel there is, and so it must be produced. There had been more than one listener to the story, and, in the latter part of that same year, or of the next, one such listener was staying at a country house in Ireland. One evening his host was turning over a drawer full of odds and ends in the smoking room. Suddenly he put his hand upon a little box. Now, he said, you know about old things. Tell me what this is. 
my friend opened the little box and found in it a thin gold chain with an object attached to it. He glanced at the object and then took off his spectacles to examine it more narrowly. What's the history of this? he asked. Odd enough, was the answer. You know the yew thicket in the shrubbery? Well, a year or two back we were cleaning out the old well that used to be in the clearing there, and what do you suppose we found? Is it possible that you found a body? said the visitor with an odd feeling of nervousness. We did that, but what's more, in every sense of the word, we found two. Good heavens! Two! Was there anything to show how they got there? Was this thing found with them? It was. Amongst the rags of the clothes that were on one of the bodies. The bad business, whatever the story of it may have been. One body had the arms tight around the other. They must have been there thirty years or more, long enough before we came to this place. You may judge we filled the well, well up fast enough. Do you make anything of what's cut on that gold coin you have there? I think I can, said my friend, holding it to the light, but he read it without much difficulty. It seems to be G.W.S., 24th of July, 1865. And that's the end of a school story. Speedy, hey, what's up? Welcome. And Harpress, how's it going? Um, yeah, I see it looks like Arian and Yumiko have also headed off, which is totally fine. I hope that you have gone off to good sleeps. Um, oh, thank you, Harpress. Yeah, I like that one. I think that one's it's very short, but yeah. It's, like, it's, it's short, it's simple, but it gets the job done. Indeed, a good story. Um, I guess it's a bit early for a break. The next one... How long are you? The Rose Garden. You're, not, you're also not too long. Okay, I guess what I might do is do the Rose Garden and see how we're going and then maybe come back for Count Magnus after a break. Um, ah, oh, Speedy, that sucks. I'm sorry. Yeah, hugs for you, friend. I hope, I hope that goes. I hope it's able to leave. Um... And I don't know, maybe listening... Yeah, oh yeah, the the COVID. Cool, I'm sorry. Yep, I... I hope you're coping okay with that. And... <sighs> getting the, uh... Getting the care and attention that... I imagine I would sure want if I was down with it. Um, as best as people are able to do. Um, yeah, I'm really sorry. That sucks. And I hope it clears off and leaves you alone soon. Um, yeah, but yes, I'm gonna I'm gonna go into another story, which is the Rose Garden. Mister and Missus Anstruther were at breakfast in the parlour of Westfield Hall in the county of Essex. They were arranging plans for the day. George said Mrs. Anstruther. I think you had better take the car to Malden and see if you can get any of those knitted things I was speaking about which would do for my stall at the bazaar. Oh, well, if you wish it, Mary, of course I can do that, but I had half arranged to play around with Geoffrey Williamson this morning. The bazaar isn't till Thursday of next week, is it? What has that to do with it, George? I should have thought you would have guessed that if I can't get the things I want in Malden, I shall have to write to all manner of shops in town, and they are certain to send something quite unsuitable in price or quality the first time. If you have actually made an appointment with Mr. Williamson, you had better keep it, but I must say I think you might have let me know. Oh, no, no, it wasn't really an appointment. I quite see what you mean. I'll go. And what shall you do yourself? Why, when the work of the house is arranged for, I must see about laying out my new garden, my, my, my new rose garden. By the way, before you start for Malden, I wish you would just take Collins to look at the place I fixed upon. You know it, of course. Well, I'm not quite sure that I do, Mary. Is it at the upper end, towards the village? Good gracious no, my dear George. I thought I had made that quite clear. No, it's the small clearing just off the shrubbery path that goes towards the church. Oh, yes, where we were saying there must have been a summer house once. The place with the old seat and the posts. But do you think there's enough sun there? My dear George, do allow me some common sense, and don't credit me with all your ideas about summer houses. Yes, there will be plenty of sun when we have got rid of some of those box bushes. I know what you're going to say, and I have as little to sorry, and I have as little wish as you to strip the place bare. 
All, all I want Collins to do is to clear away the old seats and the posts and things before I come out in an hour's time, and I hope you will manage to get off fairly soon. After luncheon, I think I should go on with my sketch of the church, and if you please, and if you please, you can go over to the links or ah, a good idea, very good. Yes, you finish that sketch, Mary, and I should be glad of a round. I was going to say you might call on the bishop, but I suppose it is no use my making any suggestion. And now do be getting ready, or half the morning will be gone. Mr. Anstruther's face, which had shown symptoms of lengthening, shortened itself again, and he hurried from the room, and was soon heard giving orders in the passage. Mrs. Anstruther, a stately dame of some fifty summers, proceeded, after a second consideration of the morning's letters, to her housekeeping. Within a few minutes, Mr. Anstruther had discovered... Oops, I just punched the microphone. Apologies. Mr. Anstruther had discovered Collins in the greenhouse, and they were on their way to the site of the projected rose garden. I do not know much about the conditions most suitable to these nurseries, but I am inclined to believe that Mrs. Anstruther, though in the habit of describing herself as a great gardener, had not been well advised in the selection of a spot for the purpose. It was a small dank clearing, bounded on one side by a path, and on the other by thick box bushes, laurels, and other evergreens. The ground was almost bare of grass and dark of aspect. Remains of rustic seats, and an old and corrugated oak post somewhere near the middle of the clearing had given rise to Mr. Anstruther's conjecture that a summer-house had once stood there. Clearly, Collins had not been put in possession of his mistress's intentions with regard to this plot of ground, and when he learnt them from Mr. Anstruther he displayed no enthusiasm. "'Of course I could clear them seats away soon enough,' he said. "'They aren't no ornament of the place, Mr. Anstruther, and rotten too. Look here, sir.' And he broke off a large piece. "'Rotten right through. Yes, clear them away, to be sure we can do that.' "'And the post?' said Mr. Anstruther. That's got to go too. Collins advanced and shook the post with both hands. Then he rubbed his chin. That's firm in the ground, that post is, he said. That's been there a number of years, Mr. Anstruther. I doubt I shan't get that up, not quite so soon as what I can do with them seats. But your mistress specially wishes it to be got out of the way in an hour's time, said Mr. Anstruther. Collins smiled and shook his head slowly. You'll excuse me, sir. "'But you can feel it for yourself. "'No, sir, no one can do what's impossible to him, can they, sir? "'I should get that post up by after tea-time, sir, "'but that'll want a lot of digging. "'What you require, you see, sir, if you'll excuse me naming of it, "'you want the soil loosened around this post here, "'and me and the boys, we shall take a time of doing that. "'But now, these here seats,' said Collins, "'appearing to appropriate this portion of the scheme "'as due to his own resourcefulness, why, I can get the bar I can get the barrow around and have them cleared away in why less than an hour's time from now, if you'll permit it. Only only what, Collins? Well now it ain't for me to go against orders no more than what it is for you yourself, or anyone else. This was added somewhat hurriedly. But if you'll pardon me, sir, this ain't the place I should have picked out for no rose garden myself. Why look at them box and Lorestinus. Now they regular preclude the light from... Uh, yes, but we've got to get rid of some of them, of course. Oh, indeed, get rid of them. Yes, to be sure, but I beg your pardon, Mr. Anstruther. I'm sorry, Collins, but I must be getting on now. I hear the car at the door. Your mistress will explain exactly what she wishes. I'll tell her, then, that you can see your way to clearing away the seats at once, and the post this afternoon. Good morning. Collins was left rubbing his chin. Mrs. Anstruther received the report with some discontent, but did not insist upon any change of plan. By four o'clock that afternoon she had dismissed her husband to his golf, had dealt faithfully with Collins and with the other duties of the day, and, having sent a campstool and umbrella to the proper spot, had just settled down to her sketch of the church as seen from the shrubbery, when a maid came hurrying down the path to report that Mrs. Wilkins had called. Mrs. Wilkins was one of the few remaining members of the family from whom the Anstruthers had bought the Westfield estate some few years back. She had been staying in the neighbourhood, and this was probably a farewell visit. "'Perhaps you could ask Miss Wilkins to join me here,' said Mrs. Anstruther, and soon Miss Wilkins, a person of mature years, approached. "'Yes, I'm leaving the ashes tomorrow. 
and I shall be able to tell my brother how tremendously you have improved the place. Of course, he can't help regressing the old house just a little, as I do myself, but the garden is really delightful now. I'm so glad you can say so, but you mustn't think we've finished our improvements. Let me show you where I mean to put a rose garden. It's close by here. The details of the project were laid before Miss Wilkins at some length, but her thoughts were evidently elsewhere. Yes, delightful, she said at last rather absently, but do you know, Mrs. Anstruther, I'm afraid I was thinking of old times. I'm very glad to have seen just this spot again before you altered it. Frank and I had quite a romance about this place. Yes, said Mrs. Anstruther smilingly. Do tell me what it was. Something quaint and charming, I'm sure. Not so very charming, but it has always seemed to me curious. Neither of us would ever be here alone when we were children, and I'm not sure that I should care about it now in certain moods. It is one of those things that can hardly be put into words, by me at least, and that sounds rather foolish if they are not properly expressed. I can tell you after a fashion what it was that gave us, well, almost a horror of the place when we were alone. It was toward the evening of one very hot autumn day, when Frank had disappeared mysteriously about the grounds, and I was looking for him to fetch him to tea, and going down this path I suddenly saw him, not hiding in the bushes as I rather expected, but sitting on the bench in the old summer-house. There was a wooden summer-house here, you know, up in the corner, asleep, but with such a dreadful look on his face that I really thought he must be ill or even dead. I rushed at him and shook him, and told him to wake up, and wake up he did, with a scream. I assure you the poor boy seemed almost beside himself with fright. He hurried me away to the house, and was in a terrible state all that night, hardly sleeping. Someone had to sit up with him, as far as I remember. He was better very soon, but for days I couldn't get him to say why he had been in such a condition. It came out, at last, that he had really been asleep, and he had had a very odd disjointed sort of dream he never saw much of what was around him but he felt the scenes most vividly first he made out that he was standing in a large room with a number of people in it and that someone was opposite to him who was very powerful and he was being asked questions which he felt to be very important and whenever he answered them someone either the person opposite to him or someone else in the room seemed to be as he said, making something up against him. All the voices sounded to him very distant, but he remembered bits of the things that were said. Where were you on the 19th of October? And is this your handwriting? And so on. I can see now, of course, that he was dreaming of some trial, but we were never allowed to see the papers, and it was odd that a boy of eight should have such a vivid idea of what went on in a court. All the time he felt, he said, the most intense anxiety and oppression and hopelessness, though I don't suppose he used such words as that to me. Then, after that, there was an interval in which he remembered being dreadfully restless and miserable. And then there came another sort of picture, when he was aware that he had to come out of doors on a dark, raw morning with a little snow about. It was in a street or at any rate among houses, and he felt that there were numbers and numbers of people there too, and that he was taken up some creaking wooden steps and stood on a sort of platform, but the only thing he could actually see was a small fire burning somewhere near him. Someone who had been holding his arm left hold of it and went towards this fire, and then he said the fright he was in was worse than at any other part of his dream. If I had not wakened him up, he didn't know what would have become of him. A curious dream for a child to have, wasn't it? Well, so much for that. It must have been later in the year that Frank and I were here, and I was sitting in the arbour just about sunset. I noticed the sun was going down, and told Frank to run in and see if tea was ready while I finished a chapter in the book I was reading. Frank was away longer than I expected, and the light was going out so fast that I had to bend over my book to make it out. All at once I became conscious that someone was whispering to me inside the arbour. The only words I could distinguish, or thought I could, were something like, Pull, pull, I'll push, you pull. I started up in something of a fright. The voice, 
it was little more than a whisper, sounded so hoarse and angry, and yet as if it came from a long, long way off, just as it had done in Frank's dream. But though I was startled, I had enough courage to look around and try to make out where the sound came from. And, well, this sounds very foolish, I know, but still it is the fact. I made sure that it was strongest when I put my ear to an old post which was part of the end of the seat. I was so certain of this that I remember making some marks on the post, as deep as I could with the scissors out of my work basket. I don't know why. I wonder, by the way, whether that isn't the very post itself. Well, yes, it might be. There are marks and scratches on it, but one can't be sure. Anyhow, it was just like that post you have there. My father got to know that both of us had had a fright in the arbour, and he went down there himself one evening after dinner, and the arbour was pulled down at very short notice. I recollect hearing my father talking about it to an old man who used to do odd jobs in the place, and the old man saying, Don't you fear for that, sir. He's fast enough in there without no one. Without no one, don't take and let him out. But when I asked who it was, I could get no satisfactory answer. Possibly my father or mother might have told me more about it when I grew up, but, as you know, they both died when we were still quite children. I must say, it has always seemed very odd to me, and I've often asked the other people in the village whether they knew of anything strange. But either they knew nothing or they wouldn't tell me. Dear, dear, how I have been boring you with my childish remembrances, but indeed that arbour did absorb our thoughts quite remarkably for a time. You can fancy, can't you, the kind of stories that we made up for ourselves. Well, dear Mrs Anstruther, I must be leaving you now. We shall meet in town this winter, I hope, shan't we? Etc., etc. The seats and the post were cleared away and uprooted, respectively, by that evening. Late summer weather is proverbial, proverbially treacherous, and during dinner time Mrs. Collins sent up to ask for a little brandy, because her husband had took a nasty chill, and she was afraid he would not be able to do much the next day. Mrs. Anstruther's morning reflections were not wholly placid. She was sure some roughs had got into the plantation during the night. And another thing, George, the moment that Collins is about again, you must tell him to do something about the owls. I never heard anything like them, and I'm positive one came and perched somewhere just outside our window. If it had come in, I should have been out of my wits. It must have been a very large bird from its voice. Didn't you hear it? No, of course not. You are sound asleep, as usual. Still, I must say, George, you don't look as if your night had done you much good. My dear, I feel as if another of the same would turn me silly. You have no idea of the dreams I had. I couldn't speak of them when I woke up, and if this room wasn't so bright and sunny, I shouldn't care to think of them even now. Well, really, George, that isn't very common with you, I must say. You have... You must have... No, you only had what I had yesterday, unless you had tea at that wretched clubhouse. Did you? No, no, nothing but a cup of tea and some bread and butter. I should really like to know how I came to put my dream together, as I suppose one does put one's dreams together from a lot of little things one has been seeing or reading. Look here, Mary, it was like this. If I shan't be boring you, I wish to hear what it was, George. I will tell you when I have had enough. All right. I must tell you that it wasn't like other nightmares in one way, because I didn't really see anyone who spoke to me or touched me, and yet I was most fearfully impressed with the reality of it all. First, I was sitting, no, moving about in an old-fashioned sort of panel room. I remember there was a fireplace and a lot of burnt papers in it, and I was in a great state of anxiety about something. There was someone else, a servant, I suppose, because I remember saying to him, horses as quick as you can, and then waiting a bit. And next I heard several people coming upstairs and a noise like spurs on a boarded floor, and then the door opened, and whatever it was that I was expecting happened. Yes, but what was that? You see, I couldn't tell. It was the sort of shock that upsets you in a dream. You either wake up or else everything else goes black. That was what happened to me. Then I was in a big, dark-walled room, panelled 
I think, like the other, and a number of people, and I was evidently standing your trial, I suppose, George. Goodness, yes, Mary, I was. Did you dream that too? How very odd. No, no, I didn't get enough sleep for that. Go on, George, and I will tell you afterwards. Yes, well, I was being tried for my life, I have no doubt, from the state I was in. I had no one speaking for me, and somewhere there was a most fearful fellow on the bench. I should have said only that he seemed to be pitching me, pitching into me most unfairly, and twisting everything I said, and asking most abominable questions. What about? Why, dates when I was at particular places, and letters I was supposed to have written, and why I had destroyed some papers, and I recollect his laughing at answers I made in a way that quite daunted me. It doesn't sound much, but I can tell you, Mary, it was really appalling at the time. I'm quite certain there was such a man once, and a most horrible villain he must have been. The things he said. Thank you, I have no wish to hear them. I can go to the links any day myself. How did it end? Oh, against me. He saw to that. I do wish, Mary, I could give you a notion of the strain that came after that, and seemed to me to last for days waiting and waiting and sometimes writing things I knew to be enormously important to me and waiting for answers and none coming and after that I came out. Ah, what makes you say that? Did you know the sort of thing I saw? Was it a dark cold day and snow in the streets and a fire burning somewhere near you? By George it was! You have had the same nightmare. Really not? Well, it is the oddest thing. Yes, I have no doubt it was an execution for high treason. I know I was laid on straw and jolted along most wretchedly, and then had to go up some steps, and someone was holding my arm, and I remember seeing a bit of a ladder and hearing a sound of a lot of people. I really don't think I could bear now to go into a crowd of people and hear the noise they make talking. However, mercifully, I didn't get to the real business, the dream passed off with a sort of thunder inside my head. But, Mary, I know what you're going to ask. I suppose this is an instance of a kind of thought reading. Miss Wilkins called yesterday and told me of a dream her brother had as a child when they lived here, and something did no doubt make me think of that when I was awake last night listening to those horrible owls and those men talking and laughing in the shrubbery. By the way, I wish you would see if they had done any damage and speak to the police about it. And so, I suppose, from my brain it must have got into yours while you were asleep. Curious, no doubt, and I am sorry it gave you such a bad night. You had better be as much in the fresh sorry, you better be as much in the fresh air as you can today. Oh, it's it's all right now. I think I will go over to the lodge and see if I can get a game with any of them. And you? I have enough to do for this morning and this afternoon, if I am not interrupted. There is my drawing. To be sure. I want to see that finished very much. No damage was discoverable in the shrubbery. Mr. Anstruther surveyed the faint, with faint interest the site of the rose garden, where the uprooted post still lay, and the hole it had occupied remained unfilled. Collins, upon inquiry made, proved to be better, but quite unable to come to his work. He expressed, by the mouth of his wife, a hope that he hadn't done nothing wrong clearing away them things, Mrs. Collins added that there was a lot of talking people in Westfield, and the hold ones was the worst. Seemed to think everything of them having been in the parish longer than what other people had. But as to what they said, no more could then be ascertained than it had quite up sorry, than that it had quite upset Collins, and was a lot of nonsense. Recruited by lunch and a brief period of slumber, Mrs. Anstruther settled herself comfortably upon her sketching chair in the path leading through the shrubbery to the side gate of the churchyard. Trees and buildings were among her favourite subjects, and here she had good studies of both. She worked hard, and the drawing was becoming a really pleasant thing to look upon by the time that the wooded hills to the west had shut off the sun. Still, she would have persevered, but the light changed rapidly, and it became obvious that the last touches must be added on the morrow. She rose and turned towards the house, pausing for a time to take delight in the limpid green western sky. 
Then she passed on between the dark box bushes, and, at a point just before the path debouched on the lawn, she stopped once again and considered the quiet evening landscape, and made a mental note that that, that must be the tower of one of the roofing churches that one caught on the skyline. Then a bird, perhaps, rustled in the box bush on her left, and she turned and stared at seeing what at first she took to be a fifth of November mask peeping out among the bushes. She looked closer. It was not a mask. It was a face, large, smooth and pink. She remembers the minute drops of perspiration which were staring from its forehead. She remembers how the jaws were clean-shaven and the eyes shut. She remembers also and with an accuracy which makes the thought intolerable to her, how the mouth was open and a single tooth appeared below the upper lip. As she looked, the face receded into the darkness of the bush. The shelter of the house was gained, and the door shut before she collapsed. Mr. and Mrs. Anstruther had been for a week or more recruiting at Brighton before they received a circular from the Essex Archaeological Society, and a query as to whether they possessed certain historical portraits which it was which it was desired to include in the forthcoming work on Essex portraits to be published under the society's auspices. There was an accompanying letter from the secretary which contained the following passage. We are specially anxious to know whether you possess the original of the engraving of which I enclose a photograph. It represents Sir William Scroggs, Lord Chief Justice under Charles II, who, as you doubtless know, retired after his disgrace to Westfield, and is supposed to have died there in remorse. It may interest you to hear that a curious entry has recently been found in the registers, not of Westfield, but of Prior's Ruthing, to the effect that the parish was so much troubled after his death that the rector of Westfield summoned the parsons of all the Ruthings to come and lay him which they did. The entry ends by saying, The stake is in a field adjoining to the churchyard of Westfield on the west side. Perhaps you can let us know if any tradition to this effect is current in your parish. The incidents which the enclosed photograph recalled were productive of a severe shock to Mrs. Anstruther. It was decided that she must spend the winter abroad. Mr. Anstruther when he went down to Westfield to make the necessary arrangements, not unnaturally told his story to the rector, an old gentleman, who showed little surprise. Really, I had managed to piece out for myself very much what must have happened, partly from old people's talk and partly from what I saw in your grounds. Of course, we have suffered to some extent also. Yes, it was bad at first, like owls, as you say, and men talking sometimes. One night it was in this garden, and at other times about several of the cottages. But lately there has been very little. I think it will die out. There is nothing in our registers except the entry of the burial, and what I, for a long time, took to be the family motto. But last time I looked at it, I noticed that it was added in a later hand, and the initials of one of our rectors, quite late in the 17th century. A. C. Augustine Crompton. Here it is, you see, quieta non movere. I suppose, well, it is rather hard to say exactly what I do suppose. And that's the end of that story. And I should go and find the translation of that Latin, because uh, if I can find it quickly, it's on page 128. It translates as do not disturb quiet things, or let sleeping dogs lie. And so, yes, that's the end of the Rose Garden. Thank you. And seems about a good time to go and take a break, I think. Ooh. Yeah, like fireworks. Yeah, I like that one. I, I enjoyed that one and the other one before it, the school school story. Um, I, I think, yeah, good stories. Again, sort of very simple, and in in the format of a short story, it's like you, you often get, you know, here's here's the setup, here's the person, like immediately it's the setup. Ah, oh, there's a, a spooky post in the garden. Hmm, that's odd. And then someone showed, or like, uh, sorry, an, an ordinary post. It's not even a spooky post. It's just there's a just a post in the garden. Hmm, we should do something about that. Then 
someone immediately shows up and goes, oh yeah, something spooky happened to me here. And then, bang, straight away afterwards, oh, something spooky happened to me when I tried to do the thing with the thing that we thought was ordinary. Ha, huh. I wonder if they're connected. Yes, it was ghosts. But, that's, you know, that's not to, uh, like, knock it or anything, because it's it's done well. And, yeah, I like... I like the way James tells these stories and like yeah sets them up and carries the uh, the atmosphere to it and stuff. It's good, but uh, yeah, I think I should go for a break and then I have one more that I will read afterwards. Count Magnus. It's also not a particularly long story, so it's going to be a shorter stream. But I'm getting quite hungry and other things. Um, and some extra dead languages for dead peoples. Oh. Yeah, so there's one that I'm not reading tonight, which I was thinking of, and then I started reading, and, like, the entire first paragraph is in Latin. Um, yeah, The Treasure of Abbot Thomas. If you ever, if you want to go look that up, uh, yeah, by M.R. James, The Treasure of Abbot Thomas. It's, like, just literally opened with a long, old paragraph of Latin. And then there's some other, like, big block capital lines of random letters for some kind of weird code that's discovered or whatever. It, it, yeah. It looks like it's going to be a good story, but I, sadly I don't think it's one that would suit this channel. Um, because there's a lot of Latin and a lot of other stuff. Um, but yeah, gonna go to a quick break and we'll see you back here in about five minutes or so. Goodbye for now.
I'm back. And yeah, thank you, Harpers. Those those sound great. I I'm not going to stand a chance at pronouncing them. Um, if, if I'm into dried sausages, yes, yes, absolutely. Um, yeah. So yeah, for those not seeing chat, I've I've asked Harpers because we found a a sort of Polish grocery store in in town, and went in there and. It's it's amazing. Everything looks really good, but I I don't know the language, and so I don't know what things actually are. Outside of looking and being like sort of the broad strokes of like this looks like pastry, this looks like chocolate, that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, it's, it's sort of it's tough knowing what to get, but I I definitely want to try things from there. I did see like what looked like packets of pierogi. Which I feel like is a thing that I should try. Although I'm going to struggle to follow the cooking instructions if they're more complicated than 220 minutes. Um, but yeah, no, these are these look, are some strong recommendations. You can get them frozen, and they are like yeah, exactly. I they, I mean, they, they look like they had ones in like sort of fresh packets even. Um, but yeah, we should should definitely go back in and have a look around. Um, because I yeah, I I know one thing, and again if I I don't know how to pronounce it, because I know it's got like a is it an accent over the Z or something that's yeah. So if if I just say jaziki, and apologise, um, fresh ones in packets better neat. Okay, yeah I should I should go back and just be brave and buy something that I don't understand and try and eat it. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, exactly. That little dot over Z, which I I I know is going to be doing a lot of work. Um, Yagiki, is that more like that? Okay. Or is it like is it like a soft G? Or how how hard is the G in there? Um, but yes. So I'm I'm glad I to discover I've been saying it completely wrong. That's good. Um, I should just actually there'll be a guide online. I could Google the name and how to pronounce this and like work from there. But yeah, those things I used to buy them years ago in the, the supermarket that I used to go to because they had like a little, I guess Polish food section. Uh, uh, the Z with the dot is more like jam, right? Okay, like yajiki. Oh yeah, that oh yeah. Suddenly saying. That, saying yajiki that makes sense it's like oh right yes that's how yeah um, I'll wait for confirmation that I'm getting that right but yeah those things it's really close hey nice well I'll take that um, yeah I, I love them they're so good I got some coffee and coconut ones and the, the coffee ones are excellent I really like the coconut ones basically hedgehog so that yej Basically, hedgehog. Nice. That's really cute. Today on Polish lessons with Harpris. I mean, surely Polish lessons by text has to be really difficult. So, excellent job, Harpris. Thank you very much. Um, you know, I'm, I'm out there beating Elden Ring bosses and learning Polish. It's it's an easy day. Uh, so is that Yezik so is a little hedgehog because they're a bit like hedgehog. That's that's really cute. I love them. Um, and also really cute. I have just Joey sleep on my lap with the grumpiest face on because he's just pressing his cheek into my leg. Um, but yeah, I hope I hope everyone's had a good break and done the things that you needed to do during the break that we gave you. Probably got another minute. I can ramble more if needed. Um, but yeah. And also forgot to say early on. I hope the I hope the sound mix and levels are okay. It looks now that I'm looking at the the audio, it looks like a little bit quiet. Like I could maybe bring the gain up a little bit. So I might just risk it. Not much, but just like a tiny, tiny amount. Um. Because yeah, I'm still still dialing in, for me comfortably like the new mic, and obviously never being able to hear it back myself while live is uh is what makes it difficult. You've just gotta guess and hope. 
But, um... You were turned all the way up? Ah, right, yeah. I uh, I feared as much. Yes, again, it's it's the way OBS reports the volume makes me super cautious to turn things up because it looks like it should be, like, painfully loud. But actually, you, you want to be getting it right up close to to loud. So, okay, I've I've added... I'm just, I'm just keep turning it up now. So, oh, that's way too much. Yep. Okay, that's too much. Yeah, I've just cranked the gain up a fair bit, um, in the hope. Now that you've adjusted your volume for what I was at, I've now gone and turned the volume up just to to make your lives worse. Apologies. Sorry. Um, but yeah, with that with that done, I guess I shall read this next and probably last story for this evening because I've not got any others prepared. Um. I read this one last week, so it might I might not be quite as clean on some of this. But, um, yeah, our, our third story for tonight. By, still, M.R. James. Count Magnus. By what means the pap... Excuse me? Yeah, okay. By what means the papers out of which I have made a connected story came into my hands is the last point which the reader will learn from these pages. But it is necessary to prefix to my extracts from them a statement of the form in which I possess them. They consist, then, partly of a series of collections for a book of travels, such a volume as was a common product of the forties and fifties. Horace Marriott's Journal of a Residence in Jutland and the Danish Isles is a fair specimen of the class to which I allude. These books usually treated of some unfamiliar district on the continent. They were illustrated with woodcuts or steel plates. They gave details of hotel accommodation and of means of communication, such as we now expect to find in any well-regulated guidebook. And they dealt largely in reported conversations with intelligent foreigners, racy innkeepers and garrulous peasants. In a word, they were chatty begun with the idea of furnishing material for such a book, my papers as they progressed assumed the character of a record of one single personal experience, and this record was continued up to the very eve, almost of its termination. The writer was a Mr. Roxall. For my knowledge of him I have to depend entirely on the evidence his writings afford, and from these I deduced that he was a man past middle age, possessed of some private means, and very much alone in the world. He had, it seems, no settled abode in England, but was a denizen of hotels and boarding-houses. It is probable that he entertained the idea of settling down at some future time which never came, and I think it is also likely that the Pantechnicon fire in the early seventies must have destroyed a great deal that would have thrown light on his antecedents, for he refers once or twice to property of his that was warehoused at that establishment. It is further apparent that Mr. Roxall had published a book and that it treated of a holiday he had once taken in Brittany. More than this I cannot say about his work, because a diligent search in bibliographical works has convinced me that it must have appeared either anonymously or under a pseudonym. As to his character, it is not difficult to form some superficial opinion. He must have been an intelligent and cultivated man. It seems that he was near being a fellow of his, Ox his, uh, fellow of his college at Oxford. Brass knows, as I recall from the calendar, his besetting fault was pretty clearly that of over-inquisitiveness, possibly a good fault in a traveller, certainly a fault for which this traveller paid dearly enough in the end. On what proved to be his last expedition, he was plotting another book. Scandinavia, a region not widely known to Englishmen forty years ago, had struck him as an interesting field. He must have lighted on some old Swedish, some old books of Swedish history or memoirs, and the idea had struck him that there was room for a book descriptive of travel in Sweden, interspersed with episodes from the history of some of the great Swedish families. He procured letters of introduction, therefore, to some persons of quality in Sweden, and set out thither in the early summer of 1863. Of his travels in the north there is no need to speak. 
nor of his residence of some weeks in Stockholm. I need only mention that some savant resident there put him on the track of an important collection of family papers belonging to the proprietors of an ancient manor house in Vestergothland, and obtained for him permission to examine them. The manor house, or Hergard in question, is to be called Robeck, though that is not its name. It is one of the best buildings of its kind in all the country, and the picture of it in Dahlenberg's Socia Antiqua et Moderna, engraved in 1694, shows it is very much as the tourist may see it today. It was built soon after 1600, and is, roughly speaking, very much like an English house of that period in respect of material, red brick with stone facings, and style. The man who built it was a scion of the great house of de la Gardie, and his descendants possess it still. De la Gardie is the name by which I will designate them when mention of them becomes necessary. They received Mr. Roxall with great kindness and courtesy, and pressed him to stay in the house as long as his researches lasted. But, preferring to be independent, and mistrusting his powers of convers conversing in Swedish, he settled himself at the village inn, which turned out quite sufficiently comfortable, at any rate during the summer months. This arrangement would entail a short walk daily to and from the manor house of something under a mile. The house itself stood in a park, and was protected, we should say grown up, with large old timber. Near it you found the walled garden, and then entered a close wood fringing one of the small lakes with which, one, with which the whole country is pitted. Then came the wall of the domain, and you climbed a steep knoll, a knob of rock lightly covered with soil, and on the top of this stood the church, fenced in with tall, dark trees. It was a curious building to English eyes. The nave and aisles were low, and filled with pews and galleries. In the western gallery stood the handsome old organ, gaily painted and with silver pipes. The ceiling was flat, and had been adorned by a seventeenth-century artist with a strange and hideous last judgment, full of lurid flames, falling cities, burning ships, crying souls, and brown and smiling demons. Handsome brass coronet hung from the roof. The pulpit was like a doll's house covered with little painted wooden cherubs and saints. A stand with three hourglasses was hinged to the preacher's desk. Such sights as these may be seen in many a church in Sweden now, but what distinguished this one was an addition to the original building. At the eastern end of the north aisle, the builder of the manor house had erected a mausoleum for himself and his family. It was a largish, eight-sided building, lighted by a series of oval windows, and it had a domed roof, topped by a kind of pumpkin-shaped object rising into a spire, a form in which Swedish architects greatly delighted. The roof was of copper externally and was painted black, while the walls, in common with those of the church, were staringly white. To this mausoleum there was no access from the church, it had a portal and steps of its own on the northern side. Past the churchyard the path to the village goes, and not more than three or four minutes bring you to the inn door. On the first day of his stay at Robach, Mr. Roxall found the church, open, church door open, and made those notes of the interior which I have epitomised. Into the mausoleum, however, he could not make his way. He could, by looking through the keyhole, just describe that there were fine marble effigies and sarcophagi of copper, and a wealth of armorial ornament which made him very anxious to spend some time in investigation. The papers he had come to examine at the manor house proved to be of just the kind he wanted for his book. There were family correspondence, journals, and account books of the earliest owners of the estate, very carefully kept and clearly written full of amusing and picturesque detail. The first de la Gardie appeared in them as a strong and capable man. Shortly after the building of the mansion there had been a period of distress in the district, and the peasants had risen and attacked several chateaux and done some damage. 
The owner of Robeck took a leading part in suppressing the trouble, and there was reference to executions and ringleaders and severe punishments inflicted with no sparing hand. The portrait of this Magnus de la Gardi was one of the best in the house, and Mr. Roxall studied it with no little interest after his day's work. He gives no detailed description of it, but I gather that the face impressed him rather by its power than by its beauty or goodness. In fact, he writes that Count Magnus was an almost phenomenally ugly man. On this day, Mr. Roxall took his supper with the family and walked back in the late but still bright evening. I must remember, he writes, to ask the sexton if he can let me into the mausoleum at the church. He evidently has access to it himself, for I saw him tonight standing on the steps and, as I thought, locking or unlocking the door. I find that early on the following sorry, yeah I find that early on the following day Mr Roxall had some conversation with his landlord his setting it down at such length as he does surprised me at first but I soon realized that the papers I was reading were at least in their beginning the materials for the book he was meditating and that it was to have been one of those quasi journalistic productions which admit of the introduction of an admixture of conversational matter his object, he says, was to find out whether any traditions of Count Magnus de la Gardi lingered on any of the scenes of that gentleman's activity, or whether the popular estimates of him were favourable or not. He found that the Count was decidedly not a favourite. If his tenants came late to their work on the days which they owed to him as Lord of the Manor, they were set on the wooden horse, or flogged and branded in the manor house yard. One or two cases there were of men who had occupied land which encroached on the Lord's domain, and whose houses had been mysteriously burnt on a winter's night, with the whole family inside. But what seemed to dwell on the innkeeper's mind most, for he returned to the subjects more than once, was that the Count had been on the black pilgrimage and had brought something or someone back with him. You will naturally inquire, as Mr. Roxall did, what the black pilgrimage may have been, but your curiosity on the point must remain unsatisfied for the time being, just as his did. The landlord was evidently unwilling to give a full answer, or indeed any answer on the point, and, being called out for a moment, trotted off with obvious alacrity, only putting his head in at the door a few minutes afterwards to say that he was called away to Skara and should not be back till evening. So, Mr. Roxall had to go unsatisfied to his day's work at the manor house. The papers, on which he was just then engaged, soon put his thoughts into another channel, for he had to occupy himself with glancing over the correspondence between Sophia Albertina in Stockholm and her married cousin Ulrike Leonora at Robach in the years 1705 to 1710. The letters were of exceptional interest from the light they threw upon the culture of that period in Sweden, as anyone can just testify who has read the full edition of them in the publications of the Swedish Historical Manuscripts Commission. In the afternoon he had done with these, and after returning the boxes in which they were kept to their places on the shelf, he proceeded, very naturally, to take down some of the volumes nearest to them, in order to determine which of them had best be his principal subject of investigation next day. The shelf he had hit upon was occupied mostly by a collection of account books in the writing of the first Count Magnus, but one among them was not an account book, but a book of alchemical and other tracts in another 16th century hand. Not being very familiar with alchemical literature, Mr. Roxall spends much space which he might have spared in setting out the names and beginnings of the various treatises. The Book of the Phoenix, Book of the Thirty Words, Book of the Toad, Book of Miriam, Turba Philosophorum, and so forth. And then he announces, with a good deal of circumstance, his delight at finding on a leaf with a good deal of sorry on a leaf originally left blank near the middle of the book, some writings of Count Magnus himself headed Liber Nigre uh, Peregrinationis. It is true that only a few few lines were written, but there was enough 
there was quite enough to show that the landlord had that morning been referring to a belief at least as old as the time of Count Magnus, and probably shared by him. This is the English of what was written. If any man desires to obtain a long life, if he would obtain a, if he would obtain a faithful messenger and see the blood of his enemies, it is necessary that he should first go into the city of Chorazin, and there salute the prince. Here there was an erasure of one word, not very thoroughly done, so that Mr. Roxall felt pretty sure that he was right in reading it as Eris, of the air. But there was no more of the text copied, only a line in Latin, Quere reliqua hujus materi inter secretora. See the rest of this matter among the more primitive things. It could not be denied that this threw a rather lurid light upon the tastes and beliefs of the Count, but to Mr. Roxall, separated from him by nearly three centuries, the thought that he might have added to his general forcefulness alchemy, and to alchemy something like magic, only made him a more picturesque figure. And when, after a rather prolonged contemplation of his picture in the hall, Mr. Roxall set out on his homeward way, his mind was full of the thought of Count Magnus. He had no eyes for his surroundings, no perception of the evening scents of the woods or the evening light on the lake, and when all of a sudden he pulled up short he was astonished to find himself already at the gate of the churchyard, and within a few minutes of his dinner his eyes fell on the mausoleum. Ah, he said, Count Magnus, there you are. I should dearly like to see you. Like many solitary men, he writes, I have a habit of talking to myself aloud, and, unlike some of the Greek and Latin particles, I do not expect an answer. Certainly, and perhaps fortunately in this case, there was neither voice nor any, nor any that regarded. Only the woman, who, I suppose, was cleaning up the church, dropped some metallic object on the floor, whose clang startled me. Count Magnus, I think, sleeps sound enough. That same evening the landlord of the inn, who had heard Mr. Roxall say that he wished to see the clerk, or deacon, as he would be called in Sweden, of the parish, introduced him to that official in the inn parlour. A visit to the de la Gardi tomb-house was soon arranged for the next day, and a little general conversation ensued. Mr. Roxall, remembering that one function of Scandinavian deacons is to teach candidates for confirmation, thought he would refresh his own memory on a biblical point. "'Can you tell me,' he said, "'anything about Corazin?' The deacon seemed startled, but readily reminded him how that village had once been denounced. "'To be sure,' said Mr. Roxall, "'it is, I suppose, quite a ruin now?' "'So I expect,' replied the deacon. "'I have heard some of our old priests say that Antichrist is to be born there, "'and there are tales—' "'Ah, what tales are those?' Mr. Roxall put in. "'Tales, I was going to say, which I have forgotten,' said the deacon, "'and soon after that he said good night. The landlord was now alone, and at Mr. Roxall's mercy, and that inquirer was not included, inclined to spare him. "'Herr Nielsen,' he said, "'I have found out something about the black pilgrimage. You may as well tell me what you know. What did the Count bring back with him?' Swedes are habitually slow, perhaps, in answering, or perhaps the landlord was an exception. I am not sure.' but Mr. Roxall notes that the landlord spent at least one minute in looking at him before he said anything at all. Then he came close up to his guest, and with a good deal of effort he spoke. <sighs> Mr. Roxall, I can tell you this one little tale, and no more. Not any more. You must not ask anything when I have done. In my grandfather's time... That is, ninety-two years ago, there were two men who said, The Count is dead. We do not care for him. We will go tonight and have a free hunt in his wood. The long wood on the hill that you have seen behind Robeck. Well, those that heard them say this. They said, 
No, do not go. We are sure you will meet with persons walking who should not be walking. They should be resting, not walking. These men laughed. There were no forest men to keep the wood, because no one wished to hunt there. The family were not here at the house. These men could do what they wished. Very well, they go to the wood that night. My grandfather was sitting here in this room. It was summer and a light night. With the window open, he could see out to the wood and hear. So he sat there, and two or three men with him, and they listened. At first, they hear nothing at all. Then they hear someone. You know how far away it is. They hear someone scream, just as if the most inside part of his soul was twisted out of him. All three of them in the room caught hold of each other, and they sat so for three quarters of an hour. Then they hear someone else, only about three hundred ells off. They hear him laugh out loud. It was not one of those two men that laughed, and indeed they have all said, they have all of them said, that it was not any man at all. After that, they hear a great door shut. Then, when it was just light with the sun, they all went to the priest. They said to him, Father, put on your gown and ruff, and come bury these men, Anders Bjornsson and Hans Torbjorn. You understand that they were sure these men were dead, so they went to the wood. My grandfather never forgot this. He said they were all like so many dead men themselves. The priest, too, he was in a white fear. He said when they came to him, I heard one cry in the night, and I heard one laugh afterwards. If I cannot forget that, I shall not be able to sleep again. So they went to the wood and they found these men on the edge of the wood. Hans Torbjorn was standing with his back against a tree, and all of the time he was pushing with his hands, pushing something away from him which was not there. So he was not dead. And they led him away, and took him to the house at Nikyoping. He died before the winter, but he went on pushing with his hands. Also, Anders Bjornsson was there, but he was dead. And I tell you about Anders Bjornsson, that he was once a beautiful man, but now his face was not there because the flesh of it was sucked away off the bones. You understand that? My grandfather did not forget that, and they laid him on the bier which they brought, and they put a cloth over his head, and the priest walked before, and they began to sing the psalm for the dead as well as they could. So, as they were singing the end of the first verse, one fell down, who was carrying the head of the bier, and the others looked back, and they saw that the cloth had fallen off, and the eyes of Anders Bjornsson were looking up, because there was nothing to cut close over them. And this they could not bear. Therefore the priest laid the cloth upon him, and sent for a spade, and they buried him in that place. The next day Mr. Roxall records that the deacon called to him soon after his breakfast and took him to the church and mausoleum. He noticed that the key of the latter was hung on a nail just by the pulpit, and it occurred to him that, as the church door seems to be left unlocked as a rule, it would not be difficult for him to pay a second and more private visit to the monuments if there proved to be more interest among them than could be digested at first. The building... When he entered it, he found not unimposing. The monuments, mostly large erections of the 17th and 18th centuries, were dignified if luxuriant, and the epitaphs and heraldry were copious. The central space of the domed room was occupied by three copper sarcophagi, covered with finely engraved ornament. Two of them had, as is commonly the case in Denmark and Sweden, a large metal crucifix on the lid. The third, that of Count Magnus, as it appeared, had, instead of that, a full-length effigy engraved upon it. The ra and round the edge were several bands of similar ornament representing various scenes. One was a battle with cannon belching out smoke and, and walled towns and troops of pikemen. Another showed an execution. In a third... Among trees was a man running at full speed with flying hair and outstretched hands. After him followed a strange form. 
It would be hard to say whether the artist had intended it for a man, and was unable to give the requisite similitude, or whether it was intentionally made a, as monstrous as it looked. In view of the skill with which the rest of the drawing was done, Mr. Roxall felt inclined to adopt the latter idea. The figure was unduly short, and was for the most part muffled in a hooded garment which swept the ground. The only part of the form which projected from that shelter was not shaped like any hand or arm. Mr. Roxall compares it to the tentacle of a devilfish, and continues, On seeing this, I said to myself, This, then, which is evidently an allegorical representation of some kind, a fiend pursuing a hunted soul, may be the origin of the story of Count Magnus and his mysterious companion. Let us see how the huntsman is pictured. Doubtless it will be a demon blowing his horn. But, as it turned out, there was no such sensational figure only the semblance of a cloaked man on a hillock, who stood leaning on a stick and watching the hunt with an interest which the engraver had tried to express in his attitude. Mr. Roxall noted the finely worked and massive steel padlocks, three in number, which secured the sarcophagus. One of them, he saw, was detached and lay on the pavement. And then, unwilling to delay the deacon longer or to waste his own working time, he made his way onward to the manor house. It is curious, he notes, how on retracing a familiar path one's thoughts engross one to the absolute exclusion of surrounding objects. Tonight, for the second time, I had entirely failed to notice where I was going. I had planned a private visit to the tomb house to copy the epitaphs, when I suddenly as it were, awoke to consciousness and found myself, as before, turning in at the churchyard gate, and I believe singing or chanting some such words as, Are you awake, Count Magnus? Are you asleep, Count Magnus? And then something more which I have failed to recollect. It seemed to me that I must have been behaving in this nonsensical way for some time. He found the key of the mausoleum where he had expected to find it, and copied the greater part of what he wanted. In fact, he stayed until the light began to fail him. "'I must have been wrong,' he writes, "'in saying that one of the padlocks of my Count's sarcophagus was unfastened. "'I see tonight that two are loose. "'I picked both up and laid them carefully on the window ledge "'after trying unsuccessfully to close them. "'The remaining one is still firm, "'and, though I take it to be a spring lock, "'I cannot guess how it is opened.' Had I succeeded in undoing it, I am almost afraid I should have taken the liberty of opening the sarcophagus. It is strange the interest I feel in the personality of this. I fear somewhat ferocious and grim old noble. The day following was, as it turned out, the last of Mr. Roxall's stay at Rohrbeck. He received letters connected with certain investments which made it desirable that he should return to England. His work among the papers was practically done, and travelling was slow. He decided, therefore, to make his farewells, put some finishing touches to his notes, and be off. These finishing touches and farewells, as it turned out, took more time than he had expected. The hospitable family insisted on his staying to dine with them. They dined at three, and it was verging on half-past six before he was outside the iron gates of Rohrbeck. He dwelt on every step of his walk by the lake, determined to saturate himself now that he trod it for the first sorry, now that he trod it for the last time, in the sentiment of the place and hour. And when he reached the summit of the churchyard knoll, he lingered for many minutes, gazing at the limitless prospect of woods near and distant, all dark beneath a sky of liquid green. When at last he turned to go, the thought struck him that surely he must bid farewell to Count Magnus as well as the rest of the de la Gardies. The church was but twenty yards away, and he knew where the key of the mausoleum hung. It was not long before he was standing over the great copper coffin, and, as usual, talking to himself aloud. "'You may have been a bit of a rascal in your time, Magnus,' he was saying. "'But for all that I should like to see you, or rather... Just at that instant, he says, I felt a blow on my foot. Hastily enough, I drew it back, and something fell on the pavement with a clash. It was the third, 
the last of the three padlocks which had fastened the sarcophagus. I stooped to pick it up, and, heaven is my witness that I am writing only with only the bare truth, before I had raised myself there was a sound of metal hinges creaking, and I distinctly saw the lid shifting upwards. I may have behaved like a coward, but I could not for my life stay for one moment. I was outside that dreadful building in less time than I can write, almost as quickly as I could have said the words, and what frightens me yet more, I could not turn the key in the lock. As I sit here in my room noting these facts, I ask myself, it was not twenty minutes ago, whether that noise of creaking metal continued, and I cannot tell whether it did or not. I only know that there was something more that I, than I have written that alarmed me, but whether it was sound or sight I am not able to remember. What is this that I have done? Poor Mr. Roxall. He set out on his journey to England on the next day, as he had planned, and he reached England in safety. And yet, as I gather from his changed hand and in consequent jottings, a broken man. One of several small notebooks that have come to me with his papers gives not a key to, but a kind of inkling of his experiences. Much of his journey was made by canal boat, and I find not less than six painful attempts to enumerate and describe his fellow passengers. The entries are of this kind. 24. Pastor of village in Scorn. Usual black coat and soft black, hair, soft black hat. 25. Commercial traveller from Stockholm going to Trollhotten. Black cloak. Brown hat. 26. Man in long black cloak. Broad-leafed hat, very old-fashioned. This entry is lined out, and a note added. Perhaps identical with number 13, have not yet seen his face. On referring to number 13, I find that he is a Roman priest in a cassock. The net result of the reckoning is always the same. Twenty-eight people appear in the enumeration, one being always a man in a long black cloak and broad hat, and the other a short figure in dark cloak and hood. On the other hand, it is always noted that only 26 passengers appear at meals, and that the man in the cloak is perhaps absent, and the short figure is certainly absent. On reaching England, it appears that Mr. Roxall landed at Harwich, and that he resolved at once to put himself out of the reach of some person or persons whom he never specifies, but whom he had evidently come to regard as his pursuers. Accordingly, he took a vehicle, it was a closed fly, not trusting the railway, and drove across country to the village of Belcham St. Paul. It was about nine o'clock on, yeah, on a moonlight August night, when he neared the place. He was sitting forward and looking out of the window at the fields and thickets. There was little else to be seen, racing past him. Suddenly he came to a crossroad. At the corner, two figures were standing motionless. Both were in dark cloaks. The taller one wore a hat, the shorter a hood. He had no time to see their faces, nor did they make any motion that he could discern. Yet the horse shied violently and broke into a gallop, and Mr. Roxall sank back into his seat in something like desperation. He had seen them before. Arrived at Belcham St. Paul, he was fortunate enough to find a decent furnished lodging, and for the next twenty-four hours he lived, comparatively speaking, in peace. His last notes were written on this day. They are too disjointed to be given here in full, but the substance of them is clear enough. He is expecting a visit from his pursuers. How or when he knows not, and his constant cry is, What has he done? and Is there no hope? Doctors, he knows, would call him mad. Policemen would laugh at him. The parson is away. What can he do but lock his door and cry to God? People still remembered last year at Belcham St. Paul how a strange gentleman came one evening in August years back, and how the next morning but one he was found dead, and there was an inquest, and the jury that viewed the body fainted, seven of them did, and none of them wouldn't speak to what they see, and the verdict was visitation of God, and how the people as kept the house moved out that saint that same week, and went away from that part, but they do not, I think, 
know that any, any glimmer of light has ever been thrown, or could be thrown, on the mystery. It so happened that last year the little house came into my hands as part of a legacy. It had stood empty since 1863, and there seemed no prospect of letting it. So I had it pulled down, and the papers of which I have given you an abstract were found in a forgotten cupboard under the window in the best bedroom. And that's the end of the story of Count Magnus. Thank you for listening.